the president, be acceptable and as effective as possible. We shall have before us at this fifth general assembly a number of grave issues which have arisen as a result of the developments in the Far East. The conflict still rages in Korea. But I'm confident that the authority of the United Nations will prevail. However, that is really only the beginning. It is also our duty to look beyond the conflict and to find means whereby peace and unity can be restored in Korea. In our view, there must, be no, there must no longer be South Koreans and North Koreans, but just Koreans who must be encouraged to work together to rebuild their country with the advice and the help and the support of the United Nations. It is difficult in and settled in a dispassionate way and on its merits. Ever since the war ended in 1945, with the victory of the Allied powers over Nazi Germany and Japan, we've been struggling to settle Europe. We entered upon this before the war itself terminated. It soon became quite clear to us that nothing would satisfy Soviet policy except peace treaties designed to ensure that the countries of Eastern Europe should be under communist regimes which were subservient to the ever-expanding Moscow. I, looking back, I do not believe now that the Soviet government ever had any sincere intention of acting in accordance with the spirit of the agreements which had been entered into during the war. Finally, in Czechoslovakia, the same was achieved by means of the coup d'etat. We have the same difficulties when we try to tackle the problem of Germany. For two years, my American and French colleagues and I strove to get agreement with the Russians. We prepared principles which would have established a unified Germany which was our aim throughout these discussions, and is still, as far as my government is concerned, I can speak with sincerity, still our aim, and I believe that is my colleagues well. But it became clear that the Soviet government did not want to unite Germany. Unified Germany was free to choose their own form of government. We wanted the Germans to choose just as the rest of us choose, in absolute freedom. And I assert, sir, that history will not blame the Western powers for the failure to set up a united Germany in a peaceful and democratic state and bringing her back into the comity of nations. Now we are confronted with a divided Germany on which we look with anxiety, lest it may be the scene of another act of aggression like that which took place in Korea. The present organization of peace really wanted war. And what are the conditions needed for disarmament? It cannot be dealt with merely by a resolution of the United Nations as proposed by the Soviet delegates. If we consider in the first instance atomic weapons, the point of dispute between us is extremely simple. As I said at the United Nations Assembly in Paris, it's all a question of confidence. Thus, if one country, when entering into an agreement of the kind proposed, closes all its doors, pulls down all its blinds, do not even let you look through, can you wonder that the rest of the nations, whose citizens' lives and liberty are at stake, say to that country, we are quite ready to enter into an agreement. Well, will you please show us that your country is also carrying it out? What is there to hide if you're abiding by the agreement and honoring it? No one wants to interfere with sovereignty. 
that if by every act you give rise to the suspicion, it is impossible to get a firm basis for the establishment of the necessary conf confidence upon which you, disarmament must be built. Then there is the Soviet proposal for one-third reduction in armament. Well, really. And we're asked to accept that as a genuine proposition. Look at the facts. The Soviet army today is larger than the armies of all Europe. And their armaments are greater than all of ours put together. This makes it look as though this talk of peace and signing petitions and peace campaigns is a propaganda barrage to weaken the victim before launching the attack. The Soviet government must not be surprised if we are not treated tomorrow. In the mind, meanwhile, I repeat, no amount of calling us warmongers or early names of this will divert us. We are determined to pursue peace and to maintain it. We are equally determined, sir, if necessary, to fight to the bitter end for the liberty for which we struggled so hard and which we are resolved to defend. Since the foundation, this. It will have its disappointments and setbacks. It will have many difficulties to overcome. But I believe this last year has seen the United Nations organization turn the corner. As I said earlier in my speech, it must feel stronger now because it now knows that it lives in the hearts of the people. Before, we did not know whether it was backed by governments alone. Now we know that it's the whole people who are pinning their faith in it. But, sir, that increases our responsibility, for it puts upon us the duty of a wider and a higher statesmanship than ever. The people will not fail, and we must not fail them. Thank you.